So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up, for me, what I think are the crucial 15 months of his life. He's still the superintendent of the Naval Observatory. It's just been changed names from the National Observatory. Now, you may think, oh, well, I know where that is. That's that thing out in Massachusetts Avenue where the vice president lives. No, the original observatory is at 23rd Street, across the street from the Department of State. United States Institute for Peace is at the bottom of the hill, heading toward the Potomac River. On the top of the hill, old Camp Hill, that's the observatory. So that's where Maury held court. Now this picture of Maury that you see up there was actually taken in London probably sometime in 1863 or 1864. But we're going to start on April the 20th, 1861. He and George Magruder went to Gideon Wells's, probably his office in the Navy Department. It could have been his home. The reason I say that is Wells's home in Washington when he was Secretary of the Navy was only a block away from the office, so it could have been in either place. Both of these men, Magruder, John Bankhead Magruder's older brother, were extremely agitated. They had just read all of the accounts of the rioting in Baltimore as Massachusetts troops tried to pass through the city to get to Washington to defend the capital. Wells felt that they were both on the brink of resigning. And he told them sort of to cool down, think it over, come on back. In the observatory on that spring afternoon, we're talking about 3, p 3 p.m., there was a scene that Maury's greatest enemies, Joseph Henry, superintendent of the Smithsonian Institution. Alexander Dallas Bache, head of the Coast Survey. They were the great scientific rivals of Maury. They competed in Congress for dollars. They competed in Congress for influence. One, the way that they described Maury was he was a popularizer and they were pure scientists. In that afternoon, one of the few times Maury actually wore his uniform, he usually dressed in a black frock coat, he wrote out a letter of resignation. His Excellency, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, I beg leave herewith to resign into your hands my commission as a commander in the Navy of the United States, respectfully, etc. M.F. Maury, which is the way he signed everything, never signed it, Matthew Fontaine, it was M.F. Maury or M. Maury or just Maury. Like Jefferson Davis, Stephen Mallory, and other members of Congress from states that seceded, no one stopped Maury from heading south. He just simply got in a hack, probably went to Alexandria and took the train, or he could have gone to Alexandria and taken uh, a steamer down. They were still running. Nobody stopped him. He was the man who was too young to have fought in the Second War with England. His brother did fight in the Second War with England. He was regarded by the Navy as either too valuable or too injured to fight in the war with Mexico. So he has no combat experience whatsoever. But he had a great understanding of 19th century naval warfare, plus he was a friend of John Letcher, the governor of Virginia. The first thing he did was when he headed when he headed to Richmond was he met with Letcher and his governor's advisory council. This is Gideon Wells, Father Neptune. The first thing Wells did was he said, I reject your resignation. So he took the names of everybody who said they were resigning. And you can go into the, in the Naval Archives, or U.S. Archives, go into the Navy Register, and you'll see lines drawn through names. And Maury, and it, it's by rank. So if it's Captain Franklin Buchanan, line through that. Uh, Captain Raphael Sams, line through that. Commander Maury, line through that. That's how they took them off the rolls. The one thing that Maury did was he was extremely careful in this writing to uh, Lincoln 
to say that he was not taking sides with the Confederacy. What he said was, I'm resigning my commission. At the foot of the Chesapeake Bay is probably the most strategically important part of Virginia, and that's Hampton Roads. You have both a land access to Richmond. You have huge agricultural products to the south of Norfolk. Think Virginia Beach and then on into North Carolina. Uh, you also have it on South Side Virginia, which were primarily still played out tobacco fields. Uh, you also have the deepest water port on the Atlantic coast in the port of Norfolk, which was also the site of the largest shipyard. The problem that happened at the tip of Hampton Roads. Oops. The problem at the tip of Hampton Roads is Fortress Monroe was still in Union hands. Fort Norfolk, the shipyard, they'd all fallen. They'd all gone to Virginia. The question then was, what do you do? John Tyler, President of the United States, member of the Virginia Convention, soon to be a Confederate congressman, told his mother-in-law that not a flower, uh, not, a, not a hogshead of flour can get by Fort Monroe because the Union Navy had positioned the remaining ships from Norfolk in front of the fort. And if you go down, follow 64, Go down to the tip, and then as you swing around toward the port of Newport News, they were basically lined up in there in addition to immediately in front of the, in front of the port. Now, how many ships were there? Probably about 20. Uh, they ranged in size from very, very small to frigates. Now, there were a few frigates, I think four. Uh, most of them were sloops, but when I say very small, I mean, you know, motorized boats. That's basically what they were. Uh, when Maury got to Letcher's office, he sat down with the governor and he sat down with the uh, Francis Henny Smith. Does anybody know who Francis Henny Smith is? The commander of VMI, Virginia Military Institute. Uh, and he also met with uh, Justice John Allen. John Allen was the chief judge of the Virginia Supreme Court at the time. What they were doing was creating a de facto war department and navy department that the governor's council was going to run. They would determine what Virginia would do for its defenses. Now, what did Maury bring to him? Well, we're going to skip through some of the stuff that he brought to him, which was, you know, steam propulsion, screw propellers. We're not going to go into any detail of that. The one thing that he brought that nobody else brought was an understanding of the power of coastal defense with torpedoes. Now, torpedoes here means mines. Now, I use the term electrically de electronically detonated. I've been corrected by two engineers. They're electrically de detonated, but they had trip wires. And they also had chemical exploders, which was very different. Now, Samuel Colt had showed the Navy this in 1840 and tried to get the Navy involved in buying it. The Navy said, well, you've got to tell us how the secret's how you're doing it. And he said, no, 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 secret's mine, proprietary. So he turned to the Army and says, i got this revolver here. Anybody interested in it? It's a repeating revolver, you know, you can aim it. And the kick, it's not so bad. And if you aim at something, probably 20 yards away, you're going to hit it. And so it, he went and did his business with the Army. The Navy, however, there were a few in the Navy, to include secretaries of the Navy like John White Mason, who was a former Virginia congressman, retained an interest in this. Why did they retain an interest? Well, because they saw what the Russians did. The Russians stopped the British and French at Sebastopol during the Crimean War. The only way that Sebastopol fell was siege. They literally starved them out. But every time they tried to assault it, the mines placed in the, in the water by George Nobel's brother, 
go back right now, can't think, I think it's Rudolph. Rudolph Nobel blocked the British fleet. And this just drove the British crazy. So if we were doing a talk on Maury when he was in the UK, they were so crazy that it would be, they started to pay him to show them how to do it. Now, right down the street from here, Richmond was so crowded at the, t at the start of the war. Population went from 30,000 to 60,000 in the space of probably nine months, and then went to 91,000, I think was the estimate, by 1863, 1864. Maury went to live with his cousin banker, Robert. Uh, now, there's a sign on a house down the street that says, this is where Maury practiced with his mines in a bathtub. Well, he did practice with mines in a bathtub. Um, both his son, Richard Lancelot Maury, and Maury himself in his diary wrote that this is what they did. Well, that's not the house. The house is across, would have been across the street, except it's now MCV's Alumni Association, if I remember correctly. It's definitely owned by uh, MCV, and the building's been long torn down. That's the house. If you go take a look, if, if you go, if you get up to the house, there's a plaque that says that this is where this is where it all took place. This was a birth of modern warfare, which I thought was kind of interesting. On, and he started practicing on this. Actually, the first day that he got down there, the diary showed. Well, I shouldn't say first day. That would be 21st. 22nd, it shows that he made an entry into the diary that he was uh, living with Robert and. That, one of the things that he had gotten, actually from the medical college, was uh, the chemicals that he needed for explosives. So that they weren't all bad. Uh, on April the 23rd, Lee formally accepted the command of Virginia's forces, Samuel Barron of the land forces. Samuel Barron accepted command of uh, the naval forces. And John Kosky wrote a brilliant book called Capital Navy that I will plug here on that and other developments. Uh, but it was, a, it was a really great thing for Virginia defenses. The Richmond Whig, who really did not like Jefferson Davis, Maury is a sound familiar to all voices of fame. Lee was the confessed hero of the Mexican War. Well, that probably exaggerated both men's roles, but they certainly were well known, at least in Virginia. Any euphoria that Maury had, it was tempered by a letter he received from Wells demanding to know the exact reason why he resigned. And what he was trying to do was set the stage for either a treason trial or a court martial because he could have been still considered part of the uh, part of the Navy. What Maury then began to do, in addition to this work on the mine, if you go over to the State Library, go into the archives, and they're, they're in really no order. It'll say, Lecture Executive Correspondence, say April 1861. And, and it's not date, it's not by date because people like me got in there and they're no longer by date, but they're, they're at least there by month. And you'll see nothing but telegrams coming in from all over Virginia as to how they could volunteer their services. Now, not all of them are addressed to Letcher. In fact, more than half of the ones that I examined, and I was you know, just arbitrarily picking them out, I wasn't trying to get a real pattern to it, Half, more than half of them were addressed to Maury because that was a name they knew. They didn't know anything about John Allen and Francis Henny Smith. He had those cadets up in uh, Lexington and whatever the heck they were doing, the only thing they knew about him was he was at John Brown's execution. He was the commander of military forces at John Brown's execution. So Maury's getting all this stuff. They're volunteering their services. The one that I loved came from Jeb Stewart's mother trying to get him a commission in the Virginia Cavalry, which I thought was kind of nice. You know, mom writing, please employ my boy. Uh, there's also one from Maury's cousin, one of Maury's, there's zillions of Maury cousins. But one of another naval officer writes in, something to the effect was, I know that you hadn't been to sea because of a severe accident, but I've been to sea, 
So I'm ready to command a ship. I mean, that's basically what the guy wrote in the letter, uh, in the telegram. And Maury, Maury did bring him into the Virginia Navy. Uh, the other one that I thought was kind of interesting, George Bankhead Magruder, or John Bankhead Magruder, wrote a letter to Maury as well. This was a letter uh, asking for a commission, which was kind of interesting. Uh, we should follow up with George. George resigned. He came south to Richmond. He was so conflicted over the war that before First Manassas, he went to Canada. He was not going to take up arms against the United States. Yet his brother did not write him. When he was down here, he wrote Maury. Anyway, what did they end up getting? They ended up getting an army that had about 35,000 volunteers. I shouldn't say an army. They had an armed force of 35,000 volunteers. Now, who was training these volunteers? And we're, we'll get into the Navy side. VMI cadets and UVA. Now, why UVA? Because there was a military department at UVA run by the chemistry department, or actually run by a professor of chemistry at, uh, at UVA, and uh, who Frankly enough, surprisingly enough, yet another Maury cousin. But that's that they weren't very close. But they had 35,000 men armed, most of them armed, equipped. Armed meant you had the gun. Equipped meant you gave them a uniform of some type. Trained, not really, not really. They had them drilling. They had them drilling at a racetrack outside of Richmond. Uh, they had them drain at Bowling Green was another large encampment. Uh, there were Harper's Ferry, uh, Lexington, and there was some stuff in, in Norfolk, which I'm never quite sure of what they were doing down there because they were more concerned not with the raising of the Merrimack, which we all think is what they were most, most concerned with, they were most concerned with the plunder that they got out of plunder, the guns, heavy naval guns. They had so many of them down there in storage that Letcher could send 75 of them, big heavy cannons, to the secessionists in Maryland and said, hey, you guys want to join us and we'll help encircle Washington? That'll be fine. The problem for the guy, for the Navy guys, was they didn't have a real warship. Uh, they had converted steamers for the most part. They had converted tugs. Uh, they had converted, well, some revenue cutters, at least two that I'm aware of. There may have been more. The revenue cutters were what would have been the Treasury Department, would be the Coast Guard today. At Maury's direction, Heavy guns, that's Letcher, were placed, where's this picture taken? Drury's Bluff. Why is it important that that happened, you placed the guns there? Take a look at the river. What do you see in the river? The river's making a bend. If the river's making a bend, ships coming up the river have to make a bend. So if you put a big gun there, Actually, you put a lot of big guns there, and then at Chaffin's Farm on the other side, put guns there. Well, the guns are good. They stop potential invaders. But you want to make sure you get them right in range? Mine the river. Force them to go to the same point so you don't have to adjust the guns. They have to come through the only open area. If they go through the mines, what happens? They're blown up. All he had to do, if, if, if anybody foresaw it, and Beauregard did, he learned the lesson from, actually from Maury, do that in Charleston, and you know what? They can send 15 gunboats up there, armored to the hilt, and not get through. And as we all know, Richmond never fell from the water. Uh, Maury wrote a very interesting thing, and he appeared in, uh, he, this one appeared in a letter to uh, a, a friend in 
I'm in Great Britain. I'm going to have to read this. A price has been set upon my head in Boston. I thank them for the honor, for I do not forget that for other days a price was set upon the heads of the best men of that state, and the cause in which I fight is far more righteous than that which moved those great and good men to take up arms against their country. The Marine Society of Salem, this is Marine Society of uh, Maury's great charts originally were for whaling, which was the second largest product of the United States. Cotton was number one, so we're not going to hold any mystery behind it. The second great charts that he made were the charts for the far, in, for the far China trade. The China traders, the Yankee traders, were based in Salem. The whalers were based in New Bedford, for the most part, and Gloucester. Yesterday, we went to, uh, we were in Fredericksburg, and there was a woman, there, there's a woman there named Rebecca Starling, and she made it her, <laughs> she made it her effort. The Marine Society took Maury's picture, turned it around, and hung it upside down, mm -hmm. and wrote traitor on the back. Mm -hmm. She took a tour group to this, showed them, and at, well, the real story is the actual picture has been stolen sometime in the, during the late 1860s. <laughs> but there's another picture hanging there, so she took the group there and they turned the picture right side up. Now, the other thing that was done to Maury at the same time was the American Philosophical Society, and Bage was a leading member of it, as was Henry, they stripped Maury of his membership in a secret meeting in January of 1862. Uh, they had never done anything like this before in their lives, but they made sure that they did it to Maury and to William F. Lynch. Mm -hmm. Lynch was a fellow naval officer, and he was the man who led the exploration of the Dead Sea, which was probably the second best known exploration, naval exploration. And no, Perry was not the best known. The Amazon ex exploration was the best known. Uh, it was an extra so I told Rebecca Starling that her next task was to go to the American Philosophical Society in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia and get that taken care of. The regular they tried to regularize the training. Maury had very good ideas, and certainly Francis Henry Smith had very good ideas of how you train troops. The problem was, of course, they did not know when the invasion was going to come from the north. If they had really thought about it, the invasion wasn't going to happen imminently. It was going to happen after the formal vote for secession, which was, I believe, scheduled for May the 22nd. It may have been May the 21st. May the 22nd of 1861. So essentially, they had about a month in which they could try to get their uh, troops trained. The Confederacy had been invited by the Virginia Convention, sitting as legislature, to move the capital from Montgomery to Richmond. That was not a happy marriage from day one. As they began trickling in, the first thing that Davis wanted to make sure was that he got control, not he, the Confederacy got control of two vital pieces of property. The one that he actually was most interested in was Harper's Ferry, where there was an arsenal. There were uh, five to 6,000 muskets there. Uh, he did not look, he was always an army guy. He was a West Point graduate. Did not realize the wealth of equipment that he had in Gosport. But he wanted that turned over as well uh, because he was going to build a, uh, a navy of some type. There's Davis. Now, Letcher wanted to hold on to Harper's Ferry. They argued and argued and argued over this. Finally, the Virginians capitulated. Davis insisted on one other thing. If you came in to join the Confederate Navy or join the Confederate Army, you reverted to your old rank. Lee became a brevet colonel. That means he's not a full colonel. He's not a colonel by promotion. That can be pulled back. Maury reverted to being a commander. 
they were supposed to then take orders from whomever was going to run the Confederate Army and the Confederate Navy. Robert E. Lee was not going to be running it, though he did become an advisor to Davis because Davis knew him and trusted him. Uh, and he did not trust many of the Virginians. Morey wrote in the late, excuse me, in the late spring, Davis and Stephen Mallory, the uh, Secretary of the Navy of the Confederacy, were small men, his words. The Confederate States government has come here feeling that there is between us and it, be, between it and us, something of an antagonism. Well, Morey was helping the antagonism, so let's, I mean, put the cards right here on the table. Although Mo Mallory sneered in his diary about what had actually been accomplished, Virginia actually had done quite a bit, if you think of it, in a month. They had Germantown, Plymouth, on the Elizabeth River. They were outfitting steamer teaser with guns to patrol the James. That was a naval side. They had 35,000 uh, soldiers. Still not very well trained, but at least ready to go. In the early summer of 1861, Richmond, an inland port, had more than its share of naval officers like Matthew Fontaine Morey. Now, that's Mallory. That's the Confederate Navy emblem. Now, what Mallory liked, and he was a former Florida senator, he had been chairman of the uh, Naval Affairs Committee in the U.S. Senate. What he liked was innovation. Morey was willing to give him innovation, but there had been long antagonism between the two of them. What Morey came up with was a plan that Mallory reluctantly agreed to. They were going to attack the Union fleet in Hampton Roads. They weren't going to attack it with the few ships they had. They were going to attack it the same way David Bushnell had tried to take out the British fleet, with either submarine attack or mines. That's Hampton Roads. If you take a look at the very tip where it says Newport News and then swing back up to where it says Fort Monroe and Point Comfort, Old Point Comfort. That's where the Union fleet was arrayed. And there would be ships, the bigger ships in the back, smaller ships in the front. They were aware Confederates were working with mines. They started putting booms out around the bigger ships to stop the mines from floating on in. Maury's idea was very similar to Bushnell. We were going to get up tight on these. Bushnell rammed a charge into the side of British ships. Didn't explode. Great danger because this guy's you're pedaling to try to get away. Maury's idea was, ah, we'll use tide and current to float it in. The electronically detonated mines that he had by that time had taken what Colt had done in the mid-1840s, and he was able to get very, very close, under the cover of night, by the light of Thatcher's Comet, the War Comet, they rode from Norfolk to attack. There were five boats. Each one had mines with them. The volunteers, and they were probably soldiers or militia, who went with Maury on this raid protested, why are we doing it on Sunday night? That's the Lord's Day. Maury said, no, no, Lincoln has put aside things like this. We need to do it. Maury's family was not very happy with the idea. When they were in position, they let the casks that they had rowed across the uh, Hampton Roads with, they set them loose. They sailed on and they moved on down the water. The boats are rowing back to Norfolk. Nothing happens. No explosion. Maury said, oh, 
the wires, there was a problem in the electric wiring. The union, when they found three casks, they found more than three, but the first three that they found were down by Fort Monroe. Those casks were water laden. So they said, oh, powder, gunpowder was wet. Wouldn't explode even if it got tangled in the ship. So take your choice. But it certainly didn't work. Maury, on the other hand, was not willing to give up. Now, how many of you have been to Rockets Wharf recently? There's condominiums in a restaurant there now. It was actually quite a busy uh, port at the time. That's Rockets Wharf as it uh, supposedly looked in 1861. The problem there, and uh, the problem that Maury wanted to do was he wanted to show the Confederate Congress and Mallory that mines worked. So he and his son rode a boat. They invited them all down to Rockets rode a boat in the middle of the James, let loose a mine on a hulk. Nothing happened. It was entangled, but nothing happened. The current of the river should have set the mine off. Well, Maury was not giving up. So what he did was he told his son, get closer, Richard. Actually, Dick, because he was, get closer. So they get closer, and then he says, Pull the cord. Boom. Fish all over the place. And I'm not kidding. It, the boat is laden with fish. But it worked. And so what happens? Mallory's convinced this is one of those crazy ideas that works. It's not going to cost a lot of money. Hey, Maury, we're going to put aside six years of hating each other. You're in charge of coastal defenses for Virginia, uh, at least for Virginia, probably for the Confederacy. And we're going to set up a, a, a bureau for you, and you're going to deal with mines. So you're going to start working on that. Every one of the Confederate Congress, every member of the Confederate Congress thought this was a great idea. Now, Maury, on the other hand, said, well, you know, if I'm in charge of coastal defense, we need something other than mines. Now, what's Mallory putting his money on? He's putting it on CSS Virginia. Raise the Merrimack with a K. Put in the angled slopes. Why do you put on angled slopes on, the, on a warship? Cannonballs bounce. They learned that from the Army. The Army, on all these forts, started to build angled walls so that it wouldn't be like Fort Macon in, in Newburn, North Carolina, or outside Newburn, North Carolina where you get a cannonball, it goes right through. No, oh, angle it, it bounces. Guess what? Fort still stands. So they said John Mercer Brook up here and Porter, the uh, naval constructor in Hampton Roads, argued over how angled they should be. And Brook said, well, the Army's found at, well, I think it was 45 degrees. 45 degrees works perfectly, and that's what it's going to be. And since Brooke controlled the money, it was at 45 degrees. Uh, I think that Porter didn't really want it, if, didn't want it that steep. I think he wanted it less so because he didn't want the ship to be tilting. Um, what they ended up doing was Maury convinced John Tyler and Letcher that the real way to coastal defense wasn't sinking $4 million in gold to build or rebuild Merrimack. And however much they were spending in uh, New Orleans, however much they were spending in Mobile, however much they were spending in Charleston, they were trying to build them all over the place. I also believe Kingston, North Carolina. There were a number of places where they were trying to build ironclads for coastal defense. They were called batteries. Maury said what you need are fast little gunboats. And what we can do with those fast little gunboats is sink the Union attackers when they're coming in, because they'll have troop transports. That's the first thing they're going to have. They're going to have to have probably barges to get them ashore. They're going to have to have something to get them ashore. And they're not going to bring those heavy ships in close in these shallow waters, because they'll run aground. So if we've got little gunboats, about 45 feet long, manned by maybe 20 to 30 guys with two guns 
we can stymie invasions all up and down 3,500 miles of Confederate coast. Well, he got strong support. Where he got the strongest support was from the Virginia Convention, still sitting as a state legislature, because they were going to make sure that Virginia was defended. This is actually a small Maury gunboat. And when I say small, they were very small. They weren't designed to go to sea. They were only designed for coastal defense. Maury was able to weed, weed, <coughs> to weed out two million dollars in appropriations to build a hundred of these gunboats to win or to stop any Union invasion. Mallory, on the other hand, reluctantly went along with this request. Davis, who had no use for a Navy whatsoever, approved it when it cleared the Confederate Congress. Maury had launched an incredible, nasty propaganda campaign writing under a name Ben Bow in the Richmond newspapers, saying that Mallory and Davis were cheating on Confederate defenses. They didn't know, you know, it was like trying to light a candle without oil and everything. Mallory was incensed. He ordered Maury to go to Cuba and buy guns there. That's how incensed he was. The Confederate Congress said, led by John Tyler, oh no, he stays. He's too valuable here. And Mallory backed off. This was going to be the only time that Mallory backed off in a confrontation with Maury. The, what Maury then decided to do was he would get to build these ships. He didn't want to build them in Norfolk where it was too costly. He didn't really want to build them in Richmond. He wanted to build them on the Bay Counties. And where was he going to get his craftsmen? He was going to get his craftsmen from soldiers going into winter duty. R. E. Lee, as military advisor to Jefferson Davis, said, that's a bad idea. They are not going to go back to their homes. We're keeping them on duty. We don't know when those Yankees are coming south again. We beat them at Manassas, but they haven't stopped. What did Lincoln do after Manassas? He called for 300,000 volunteers. So Davis said, no go. What Maury thought about his gunboats was going out like a nest of hornets, they will especially, if the building and fitting could be kept from the enemy, either sink, capture, or drive away from the Chesapeake and its tributaries the whole fleet which the enemy now has or probably will in that time in these waters. Then the nest of hornets, as he still referred to them, could go on and capture Washington. Now, I don't know. Now, you have to remember, David Farragut did capture New Orleans with basically ships only. Butler was 25, 30 miles away. But he brought in frigates and sloops. He wasn't bringing in ships. And frigates and sloops would have anywhere from 20 to 40 guns. Maury's talking about ships that have two guns with 45 guys and no Marines and no infantry backing them up. But that was the way that he did. He was very successful in that, in that campaign. He did get the money. He was now formally charged with being the head of coastal defense for the Confederacy. The work that they were doing on mines then got put into a separate bureau, one time called Submarine Bureau, another time called Torpedo Bureau, and then they called it something else. Then they created the uh, Confederate Secret Service, and, and you can go through this whole organizational chart that they created over the space of four years. But basically what it was was they took Maury's original coastal defense thing and just split it on up. Uh, what he ended up doing was that these ideas that flowed so easily from his pen were not easily translated into something that could be 
made. Uh, on March 8th, 1862, Maury's idea of the gunboat defense of Virginia was essentially scuttled. That was the Battle of Hampton Roads. CSS Virginia and the Monitor faced off, and at best it was, it was no victory. I mean, both sides claimed victory at the time. It was a draw. But the draw only worked in the favor of the Union. The Confederate Congress said, okay, you got the two million over here, but what we need are ironclads. Maury said, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, you'll get an ironclad. You're going to get an ironclad gunboat. Mm -hmm. He had not given up on the idea of the gunboats. There was very, very little support for that in the Confederate Congress. That same spring, the worst thing that could have happened to Maury occurred. John Tyler became incapacitated and eventually died. His greatest champion from 1840 on is now no longer in the picture. Maury is still laboring over getting these gunboats. He has people, oh, he has. Mallory has told the Virginia Convention that he sent people out to round up uh, engines and guns and everything, they weren't doing anything. They couldn't get enough to supply the regular Confederacy. So the problem then became, what do you do with Maury? Well, Maury's greatest contribution comes right at, as the Peninsula Campaign reaches, begins to reach its fulfillment. McClellan's coming up very slowly from Fort Monroe. What's happening as he's coming on up, even the Confederate Army is planting mines to the consternation of the Confederate Secretaries of War and the leading Confederate generals. Maury, with Hunter Davidson, has now mined the river. Remember the gun, remember the bend in the river, there are now seven ranges on the river with 20 torpedoes apiece. The first Union ship tries to get through, pounded by the guns because it's trapped and it knows that there's a minefield there. It can't get through. Maury never receives any credit from, David, uh, from Jefferson Davis for all of this work. Never. In the, if you go back and read all of that stuff that Davis has in his book, I mean his two volumes, if you go back and read his letters, that multi-volume set that came out of, I think it's Louisiana State University, um, though the papers are at Southern Methodist, I think. Uh, but it, all, he, he extols minds. He never mentions Maury once. He mentions Davidson twice, and Davidson thought he got robbed. Well, Mallory finally gets his way. Mallory gets a new set of orders cut from Maury. The seven days have passed. There has been a ship, the teaser, which we mentioned earlier, has been captured. What did they find aboard Teaser? They found a balloon, an observation balloon. The other thing that they found on there, Maury's minefields. But knowing where the mines are is good if you're going to try to steer if somebody's not shooting at you, but somebody's shooting at you. So you still can't clear the mines out of there. And in fact, when Lincoln came to Richmond in 1865, David Dixon Porter, was petrified that they were going to hit a mine when they were taking a small skiff ashore with the president in it. I mean, he was convinced that they were going to just run into something. It didn't happen. What happened 
then to Maury was his next orders were to Great Britain. Those orders were not rescinded. Tyler was not there to defend him. Charles Conrad, who was the head of the uh, Naval Affairs Committee of the Confederate Congress, uh, no, House of Representatives, was not there to defend him. He was actually in the, he was gone on active duty, I believe. Uh, so these orders stuck. Maury, for the rest of his life, regarded those orders as orders of banishment. He called it exile. For the next seven years, he is not in the United States. He is either in the UK, Mexico, and then back in the UK, and finally to Virginia. Thank you very much. And now, if you have any questions. <laughs> Finding the paths in the sea? Well, if you go to Mariner's Museum tomorrow uh, at World Oceans Day, I will be talking about, that's all I'm going to be talking about. It won't be, it won't be his war experiences. It'll be uh, in Newport News. No, uh, Maury's greatest contribution was to synthesize, synthesize thousands of logbooks over different routes across all kinds of different places. Now, they kept trying to do it, they didn't concentrate on one at the start, until finally, not his brother-in-law, but another cousin <laughs> named Whiting. Whiting says, Matt, this isn't working. Why don't we look at doing one route? You know, a good route would be Baltimore, Norfolk to Rio. Why would you want that one? Well, two reasons. You've got flour going out of both Baltimore and Richmond, and I guess probably out of Norfolk as well. You have coffee coming back, but the Navy now has a squadron called the Brazilian Squadron. They need to know best route to, to, to get to Brazil. The idea originally was to sail out, way out toward the Azores, and let the trade winds blow you back. <laughs> Maury said, well, wait a minute. We found a couple of ships that hugged the coast of Latin America, and they made it safely. One flower merchant, well, not flower merchant, captain of a flower ship named Jackson, operating out of Baltimore, sailed with a cargo of flour, and he made it to Rio in 38 days. The normal sailing time was 45 to 50. He came back with a cargo of coffee in 37 days. The normal time back was 45 to 50. Now, if you owned a ship, you're not making money if that ship's on the water. You're making money when the ship has landed with its cargo. And that was the first successful route. The next successful route, well, actually, the next successful route was to Le Havre and to Liverpool. Why? Sell cotton. Honestly, that was the reason. Sell cotton. The next route was to Bombay to show the British, let the British know that we are in the market. We are seamen of the world. Our charts are as good as the Royal Navy's. And cut the sailing time. Cut the sailing time by something like two weeks. Mm -hmm. made, a lot of made a lot of money for a lot of people. And particularly the uh, uh, New Bedford whalers <laughs> and the, and the uh, China traders. I mean, you cannot imagine the amount of money that those folks made. Yeah. So what happened to Murray? Uh, Maury came back to Virginia and organized a physical uh, survey of the state, which was key to the reconstruction of the state. Um, now, Maury's belief was in the mechanization, as 
opposed to industrialization of the state. Uh, now, when, having said that, I'll use this as the example. Remember his cousin that I mentioned, Robert Morey? Robert Morey took one of the great heroes of the Confederacy, Edward Fontaine, the president of the Virginia Central Railroad. And the way that Fontaine retained his power was that the state vote, the state owned a hunk of that railroad, like they owned the RF&P at one point, which was Lillian's retirement plan. Uh, the Virginia teachers. <laughs> uh, he forced an issue and got the state's vote to go against Fontaine. So he ousted him to create a new railroad called the Chesapeake and Ohio. Now, there's a financier sitting up in New York, and his last name's Huntington, Collis P to be specific. He's sitting up in New York and said, you know, I got some friends like Leland Stanford, and we're building this railroad from Oakland to wherever the Union Pacific can get. You know, wherever we meet, that's where this railroad will land. He said, oh, look at this. I can make a transcontinental railroad. And I don't have to go through the port of New York. There's this big port sitting down there. It's called Norfolk. And there's this peninsula down there that has all of these shipbuilders. Oh, Newport News. Newport News shipbuilding comes out of this as well. That's his son, Samuel P. Huntington. Who, was that Huntington's son, the senior? Yep. Okay. Maury was on the board of the original CNO. Oh, he was? Oh. Yes. I didn't know that. And they tried to make sure that Lee <laughs> did not get involved in it. Anyway. Mm -hmm. yep. Do you think that in the long run, for Mari's reputation, that in his historical reputation for us today, that it is ironically a good thing that his name wasn't attached to, um, in the public mind, that is, to mm -hmm. torpedoes and weapons of war, <laughs> that it allowed him to be the, the, um, the father of oceanography and the pathfinder of the seas rather than a Confederate military officer? Well, his reputation was totally trashed by, uh, by going south. The minute he resigned as head of the superintendent, as the head of the Naval Observatory, uh, he was replaced by one of his most, the, the guy he kept beating out, James Gillis, uh, to run the Naval Observatory. He was replaced by him. Uh, Charles Davis, who was a brother-in-law of uh, Benjamin Pierce, who was one of the first ast major astronomers and mathematicians in the United States, he, you can say he was Harvard-affiliated, he went to Harvard, uh, became, head of the, uh, <laughs> became head of the observatory when Gillis died. When Bache died, Pierce moved in to take over the Coast Survey. Henry remained alive. <coughs> So all of these people are out there working. The Navy went to the trouble in 1866, I think it was. It was after the war. To go through the charts, the beautiful charts. And the, and there are two places you can see them. Well, actually, three places you can see them. Uh, and they had a guy named Bernard Barnard of Barnard College fame, draw up all of the problems with the charts and the sailing directions, and they said, these aren't any good. He missed the point. The only reason that they cut sailing times was they built better ships. I mean, in, this is literally what they're saying. I mean, this, I'm, not, I'm slightly reducing it, but they built better ships, and he doesn't take that into account. It has nothing to do with the charts. The charts, by the way, there are three places you can see them. Well, <laughs> actually one place you can see them, and two places you can't. Uh, the charts are on the walls of the 
vice president's home on, uh, at the Naval Observatory. Uh, and they're gorgeous. They're huge. See that picture over there of Davis? It would run over. One of those charts would run over to the other picture. And it would be at least as big as the Davis one. Uh, the other place you can see them is in the old observatory at 23rd in Pennsylvania. Uh, and there are tours that you can, Naval Medical Command, you can get on a tour there. But they're probably not going to take you into where the charts are because the head of Navy Medicine's home is there. You know, so, I mean, that, that's, that, that's what they're... The third place is in the map room at uh, the Library of Congress in uh, the Madison Building. And there you can see them. And they're gorgeous. I mean, he, his idea was he wanted those charts so clear that an illiterate sail sailor could understand what he was seeing. So there's colors, there's angles, and it shows, you know, this is wind and all of this stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and his biggest contribution was after that was international cooperation for... Uh, charting mm -hmm. and the meteorology of the sea. He never gave up on his crusade to have a National Weather Service. Did you put some of them in the book? Oh, yeah, it's all in the book. Oh, I, I would say it's all in the book, but that's in the book, yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, are any other questions? Thank you very much. Been very attentive audience.